Welcome to the first of what I hope to be more of these conversations, public conversations with artists that I find inspiring and that um, have a rigor in, and discipline towards what I would say practices of listening to the calling that keeps them on a path towards liberation. And they all use their art practices as a way to, like as a tool to recognize where we are at, you know, in terms of our humanity and our happiness. Um, and I shared in some of my posts that I personally find these moments of connection, real connection, as a way to uh, be generative in a different form, not just in the kind of solo practice that we have, and then maybe the collaborative practice that we all share, and then there's the community practices. So I asked um, these three wonderful artists to join me in uh, discussing a couple of ideas that have um, been on my mind. But first, I'd like to introduce each one of them, and I'll start with Rochelle, and uh, Rochelle, will you share with me and, um, and the community how you identify as an artist and um, a little bit about your theory on practice, very specific to creation itself? Totally. So I am a dancer choreographer and a doula or womb worker. And, um, I have a lot of other healing practices that I weave into that, into that work, and that is kind of like the the crux of what I reach into. Um, I'm also from Memphis, Tennessee, born and raised, and my family has lived in the Mississippi Delta and Memphis for many generations. So, a lot of how I work is mining into the culture of the Mississippi Delta, the culture of the Black South, um, from like food ways to um, just like being with the medicines my people have developed over the course of centuries to move towards liberation. And um, yeah, that's those, like the songs, the dances, the ways of moving, the ways of gathering, the ways of speaking, even like the way we talk in Memphis. Like I, I have my like New York City, you know, accent now, but there's a way of like, that's part of the embodiment for me of being Southern and black. And I um, reach for that a lot. And also the honoring of my mothers in particular in that lineage. So to slow down, because we'll each have a little bit of time. Um, how do you navigate what I think most people would say the appearance of two different types of um, interest or career paths, like you have doula, you have a connection with herbs and healing, you have your own um, a commitment to connection to where you come from, and then you have the physical practice of dance and song. Mm -hmm. um, I think my question to you is, is like, how do you weave those together? and? what are the questions within this? Like, what are the questions that you're asking when you, when you work? Yeah. Those two different questions. Yeah, well, how do I weave them together? It's like, I think originally I came to uh, doula work, birth work, as a way of supporting myself, just as a woman who felt very called to support other women, primarily. And um, that I saw that as very separate initially from my dance work. And it's only in the last like couple of years where I'm now like, oh, there's actually no separation. For so long, my clients would be like, so can we like tell me about the dancing? Can we do some dancing and all the things? And I'm like, ah, I don't actually know because in my mind, I just, I hadn't integrated those. I think, and so that's more recent that integration where now it's like so much of the movement I offer <clears throat> is centered around the womb and around <clears throat> sorry helping women root into and access the power within us in that way. Um, so I think that answers the first question. 
What was the second question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you got it all okay. in there. I think you got it all in there. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to Jamila because we were in the South. Oh, so, <laughs> true. True. And um, my same question is uh, would you introduce yourself and um, your practices that you do? Yeah. Well, I do a lot. <laughs> I feel like, but I'm also happy to be in, in good company in that way. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist. Um, I, I think my introduction to art was probably through painting mostly and music. I sing uh, also. Um, I still sing. I grew up singing and painting. I still do both. Um, but I feel like I was a pretty shy person when it comes to entertainment and I kind of found my way to performance from being shy. <laughs> it was like, oh, I don't have to look at people or dance for them in, in a way that I don't want to. I can like, uh, I can look at the moon and call it a work, and it is a work. Um, so I kind of found my way to performance through that, and, and through performance, I really kind of delved into installation. And so installation work is a, probably like the biggest part of my practice now. I'm obsessed with objects and meaning and um, the history of things, the history of places, my familial history, ancestor work. And so I'm constantly trying to gather the pieces to make it make sense for me. Um, and I think right now that's a big part of what's happening is like finding home, redefining what that means when you're not actually there, um, and maintaining relationships when people have you know, graduated to the next plane, like how do I still, how do I still receive guidance, how do I still maintain the love uh, of my grandmothers and grandfathers and all my ancestors, like how do I stay in touch in a way, and I think that's my work, um, is just trying to maintain an open channel, but also providing a space for other people to do something similar or I guess, you know, spaces that help people heal or, you know, see, just rest mm -hmm. is a big part of my work. I, I, I rest a lot as a way to think or to like, I'm really into non-action where I just like lay down in the studio, do nothing for a few weeks <laughs> and then like something happens. Mm -hmm. Do you see we're all work. supporting you right now? We're like, yes. <laughs> I want to be in that piece. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a specific uh, question about the relationship with object because I've been, I too have, I have like a collection of, of a vocabulary of objects that I try, I'm working on, working with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I'm curious where you feel that history lies in the object and how do you form is it a what is it like a listening practice? Is what is how do you um, yeah how do you animate that relationship with objects like why and what and how? I, right. I think some of it's super personal. Like uh, my grandmother was a collector of handkerchiefs, and I just and slips. She loves slips. Mm. <laughs> oh, both things of which I now have in my collection because they were hers, and so I have them. Um, my grandfather kept all his license plates and just like these, these little mm. sentimental things that, that people do and I think I started collecting those kinds of objects to remember them or like have, have a way. Uh, but also objects from stores too, you know, like um, heavy into altars, which I'm sure is not a surprise to anyone in this space. Um, so I'm always like kind of thinking of vessels and ways to uh, Addition, make additions to those kinds of pieces and spiritual practices. I'm thinking, what else? How else can I answer that question? And then sometimes I think I just get lucky, and something comes to me. Um, mm -hmm. I was walking to work the other day and found a hawk feather, and now it's my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so sometimes I think I'm just open to receiving those kinds of gifts that. Uh, kind of make up their own meaning in my life. I don't think I always am aware mm. of why it's happening, but it happens a lot. Mm. Yeah. I just got this image of like, your specific art practice, almost like 
this um, rope or uh, handrail and you're just like following it mm -hmm. forward. Um, it's a different relationship of like, I am the maker, here is my clay, I will manipulate this clay and create, or I have an idea, that, that idea of where the spirit comes from mm -hmm. and ownership of things and the fact that you, we all, I appreciate this doing nothing practice is shifts that relationship of the maker and the receiver and, yeah. and the object subject stuff. And, um, you know, I, I was, yesterday was Martin Luther King Day and there was different sides in which people were responding to that. And one of them is like, never stop, keep pursuing, <laughs> never stop, keep right. persevering. And then I like, um, my mom's organization, Arts for Art, had images of him and his family, his life on vacation and the importance mm -hmm. of rest. Yeah. And I was like, yes, that's, that's what I needed. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that's like, sorry, one more thing that also inspires me is like, it's not just one thing the art making doesn't have, it just, like the moon has so many phases, it's not just all about the fullness. Right. Of like, oh, or whatever that mm -hmm. means for me, you, and others. Mm -hmm. Jossie, mm -hmm. Jossie, I've known, we've known each other since childhood, sharing a lot of similar, well, you all share a lot of similar things. Please share with well, us your art practice. <laughs> art practice, Lower East Side Girl, Harlem Girl, we met at Manhattan East Junior High School. That is an important aspect of my story because I have been craving dance classes for my parents and as uh, one of four kids being sent to Montessori school before that they made it very clear that they couldn't afford classes. And my English teacher, our English teacher, Mr. Jones, who taught Horton and Graham, right, made it clear to my mom that I could, be a, I could do scholarship programs all throughout New York. So that's that's part of my, my origin story as a dancer, and I cherish it so much. Um, so I'm a dancer and choreographer. I'm also an anthropologist and writer, um, and I am also a doula. I've been a doula for 19 years, going to 19 years next month, mm -hmm. um, February 23rd. <laughs> and um, I am a designer things, earrings, bags, clothes, and I'm a mother, a 12 year old. Mm. Um, and so my practice started working as a dancer for companies, really striving, just wanting to, to, to be a dancer, to experience what's that like, to, to, to be able to live an art form that I thought I was always struggling to do. Um, but the anthropology aspect of it, when I was in college, I went to Brazil and studied where we should dance. So talking about the information that the ancestors want us to know. I was inspired to go to Barnard because of Zora Neale Hurston and Intizaki Shange and, you know, the Catherine Dunham. So I was like, dancer, anthropology, yes, we have to understand why mm -hmm. movement is such a part of how I was raised and it's taken for granted, but I'm, I'm fighting this study to be this trained dancer. So I think navigating the anthropology and the connection to my lineage um, really strengthened me um, for later on, like how things were connected later on. Um, but I did tour for um, years as a dancer and then went back to Brazil to learn the language and then ended up um, living in Italy and working on television as a dancer. Uh, and that experience really was is important to my current practice because being an expat for almost a decade allowed me to be whatever kind of black person I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And as a New Yorker, uptown, downtown, you know, boarding school, why you talk like a white girl? You know, all of that, I got it in so many different ways and it wasn't until as an adult and an artist I could be any kind of black dancer, any kind of black person. Nobody knew, you know, I could wear my hair any kind of way. I, everything shifted for me, mm -hmm. that experience um, in terms of how I embodied owning my art, you know, and not just being what I felt was a pawn you know, because it was like the Ailey world or like the Momix Palabalist, like downtown white dance world, very, very different. Um, but I'm grateful for those experiences because coming back as a mother, um, another part of, of, I think, what's come into my practice in terms of making work on film was making forever work, having toured for years, 
internationally and knowing that one, a lot of people I loved, I couldn't share my heart and my dance with. And two, I was performing for the other all of the time. Mm -hmm. And then I lost my brother in a motorcycle accident in 2012. And that's when I said, I'm doing only work on film that can be disseminated and can be shared. Obviously, I still am a performance artist, mm -hmm. but it was really important for me as someone who picked up a camera at 13 and have always had like a relationship with photography and film. I was not being documented well. I was that little brown blub mm -hmm. in the VHS tape. And mm -hmm. you know, the art, who I was as an artist was not archived. So I became interested in how we archive our art, but also how we archive our path, our, our history, our lineage, like what we're translating through our work. Um, and so a lot of my works as I'm since then on film and as a mover, as a performance artist in site-specific spaces has been about um, mothering because of my daughter being part of my work a lot um, and also about almost like awakening a reclamation of information that we all have so that by the time we've had that experience together, we're more connected, the collective. And I think we're all translating information for each other. And whether it's through, because I do a lot of vocalizing in my performances as well. I sing as well, but I'm not a trained singer. But it's always that, that moment of impulse of what's coming through me is for everyone here because they're gonna bounce it back in a different way. So that's what I love about performance. But I also mm -hmm. am working more with how to use the medium of film, use that the way that we are sharing information on screens even more to have like this constant daily reminder of our need for a connection to the earth, for survival, not in this like poetic way. You know, I'm obsessed with mushrooms and I'm obsessed with grounding. I'm obsessed with <laughs> hugging trees, and, you know, and making that, you know, I'll come and I'll <laughs> put some leaves on the stage, you know, I'll walk on the stage and then all of a sudden, <laughs> dirt! Let's just get some I dirt. So, it. you know, that. She loves dirt. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel like it, sometimes it feels really basic. It's like pretty, you know, ABC, come on. And you, but the fact that we as, colonized people, stolen people, um, people compartmentalized into these spaces that we live in, these boxes, these cement boxes on this earth, sometimes it is a really radical act to take the earth into a room and make it a performance and say, we have to remember something. So I find myself doing that um, in my performance work and with my film, mm -hmm. searching for the messages that are coming through to, to really just translate what needs to be said over and over again. The art that we're creating is the art of not just self-liberation, but earth salvation. Ooh. Word. Earth yeah. salvation. Oh, <laughs> there's a book and yes. Yeah. 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 There's a book <laughs> I didn't say that. that yes, you did. I loved it. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think I... I kind of, I have, um, I had a crossroads. I kind of would love, I think it'll happen naturally, but I am very much interested in, in like, I think that at times individually we ignore it because it's so part of our own internal vernacular that we don't always spell it out, but like, what is your interest? What are the things that you're trying to, what is stimulating your curiosity to keep moving forward? I know a little bit, um, you have this connection to water, to water and mermaid, like that's a very specific aesthetic. It's an intro it's, and I think each of you introduce an aesthetic in a world that interests me. Like how do you use that group of material to create story with? Because I use different material and with that material you know, oh, that's a Miriam place. She's throwing gravel, and you know, or, like why Miriam in your gravel, and why the tarps, and you know, and but those objects. Why I was asking, like, I have um, my vocabulary right now is like vessel and vase, and mm -hmm. trying to see if I can listen. Can I leave a message in that vase, or did somebody else leave a message? And it's very playful, and very. Um, 
kind of stretching the way that I am hearing the other. Mm. You know, like where is the, what are, in which forms do I experience the mystical or the mm. artistic muse coming through? And yeah. I do, like I love vases and I know that there's a history of the vase as the form, as, as the female form, as the container. Mm -hmm. And that, you'll see that in Buddhist, um, uh, what do you call it, imagery. Mm -hmm. and other, uh, I'm sure, many other cultures, and rope is important, and that tension between, you know, rope to me is like something to lynch somebody with, hang them from a tree, rope. Also uterus, uh, umbilical cord, rope. Mm -hmm. Also something that I want to be tethered to, it has all these paradoxes, mm -hmm. and I enjoy learning from those things. And we all have our, our flavor. When you create, it will be a mm -hmm. Jamila creation, Jossie, Rochelle. And so, Paradox, yeah, yeah, like please, that's, go, ahead. That's, go ahead. That's helpful. I feel like I, I do feel like as interdisciplinary artists, maybe that's a lot of what we do. Um, I think some of the materials, when you asked me earlier why I choose objects or certain materials, I think sometimes it's to have, to try to have an experience that maybe my ancestors have had. So I'll. Mm -hmm. I grew tobacco for a project, for instance, mm. for a few years. I grew tobacco and from seed, not really a gardener or a farmer, but wanted to know what that was like as a person from Kentucky, as a person formerly enslaved people. I wanted to see what that felt like to actually see that process, to witness it. And what I learned was, um, and, and what I knew already, but what was affirmed was, yeah, you know, people were captured and bought here to be slaves, but they were scientists and they were agriculturalists and they were brilliant to even know how to do this thing. <laughs> and so from that experience, you know, I, I grew this thing, I made performances with it, and I also made paper from it and objects from it. So I just kind of mm -hmm. kept materializing in different ways until it finally became something that I could actually hold. So, thank you. Yeah, Sarah, that's that. it. I, so, like, a sad thing into, like, another kind of experience. I have yeah. something so similar where I did actually the same thing with cotton. Dope. And I'm, you know, I'm from cotton, King Cotton, cotton mm -hmm. capital. Nice yeah. some up there. Uh, <laughs> yes. um, and so, for me, my family's history is, like, really interwoven with this relationship of being enslaved with cotton. And cotton fields still surround Memphis whenever I go home and I leave the city. So I, I grew the cotton and I made a dance ritual honoring that relationship and also the ways that we worked with the plant medicine ancestrally and the fact that like a lot of enslaved African women were using or not using, working with cotton mm -hmm. to maintain their reproductive autonomy, even in these like dire circumstances. And that to me, I was like, oh, and then I had these moments too. Where I was traveling and I saw cotton growing wild in the Caribbean and I was like, oh, I don't have to attach these ideas of what this plant is to, like, that I've been raised with this, like, honestly, trigger point of yeah. being like, ooh, cotton. So the paradox also yeah. of, like, shifting that. I love that you brought that up, and I'm going to bring in the intergenerational because I have this, you know, bunch of cotton to show my daughter what it's like because it wasn't until I was an adult that I actually... Physically, I don't remember where I was, probably the one American tour I ever did with one company, and I actually saw cotton grow. Mm -hmm. And then these last two years, I was able to live for several months a year with my daughter in St. Croix, the Virgin Islands, mm -hmm. and on the pathway to showing her where my grandparents used to live when they retired there, up this place, this road, there's a bush of cotton. Fascinating that my 10-year-old could see what that's like and then I would talk to her about like this is what it means to pick cotton but I think because it has so much stigma attached to enslaved Africans in our history I never even wanted to have a relationship with it but it completely shifted in these last two years being on the island and passing these cotton and picking it with her and then being like so we're gonna make something and taking it home and combing it out and playing with it and just mm -hmm. It's free, it's there, it's, what is that to have that connection with the earth? Even that sense yeah. of that you know, being able to climb a mango yeah. tree, pull over on the side of the road and get her free fruit. That experience was really um, important because it gave us that connection with the land of 
not ownership, but mm. partnership. Stewardship. That, mm. that, that are indigenous. Wild or like versus in this like industrial agriculture. Or lines so. of yeah. cotton. Like that's how I was thought of growing up. Oh, it's a bush. Culture. Yeah. Yeah. It's so a bush. see it yeah. going wild. I just, that also reminds us that we are wild. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. and that feels so powerful for me. Like that juxtaposition. Yeah, I always thought there were like little rows and stuff because you see the pictures. There are these huge bushes mm-hmm. out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> I want to distill something for... I... I I love creation. <laughs> I mean, I'm a big art fan. My family has been super supportive. Your family, a lot of us come from families that are really um, testifying towards the power of being an artist and the role of an artist in community as vital. And I'm hearing the relationships that you all are sharing to material and growth and evolution and understanding and transference and all of this is like our practices as artists are like a practice of holding the land like a practice of of almost like our own real life doc um, docu series or a, um, investigatory, investigatory um, series in which we're embodying a practice and, and then sharing that practice of what can happen when we connect and um, I, I'm missing some words. I'm hoping you can help me with them. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm talking about like an interest in, in identity, history, moving forward in a progressive mm-hmm. way mm-hmm. by looking at these things and experiencing them opposed to referring them to something that is separate from us. Yeah, and that's yeah. like, yes. I think the key is like, as an artist, I'm not preaching to anybody on how to do their work. That's the interesting thing is to be his sideways and be like, whoa, you do it that way? Awesome. But I do think that in some ways, all four of us are definitely looking for ways to, as you said, like, can I touch this and experience some of what they experience Mm -hmm. and understand the complexity of it and that it is not a hit, like, is history dead or is it alive? You know, there is this wonderful, I heard somebody speak in conversation, it cannot be found on uh, the YouTubes, Um, (laughs) but in conversation, saying that it takes many, many years for something to be history. Mm. Like, something could happen last year or five years, but it doesn't have any meaning for a very long time. Mm. You know, and when does something have meaning? And like, how do we work as conduits or portals to keep something alive until maybe our community has done the healing that they need to do? Mm-hmm. And when I say our community, I mean Miriam Parker. You know what I mean? Like, let's start with myself. I don't want to be so like, oh, I'm not, you know, I, let's just Miriam. I need to heal. I'm not over it yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and, um, and one of the subject matters was time travel that I was thinking about as an important tool for um, me to not be nervous. Like, the really based stuff. <laughs> In terms of the emptiness of time, the way I experience time at this time, I have to be here. I'm I'm this age. I should have done that. Mm. Uh, death, fear, time. How do I access time? How do I be in full blossom? You know this. I, how do I live a life? So that's one idea, and that time does not does not exist outside of myself. Mm. Mm-hmm. And that there is as much as we can play with our experience of memory and history, we can play with time. Mm-hmm. And I thought to introduce that to y'all because it's also um, something that I think is innate in art making, which it becomes portals. Like, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. I mean, music for me is the number one trigger. I listen to a song, it reminds me of this. I dress a certain way or I see myself, you know, like 
just that that people are craving also to work with time and I don't you know again I'm gonna you know I'm call me biased but art is the most important thing in the world <laughs> you know what I mean and 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 know it I don't know if I had a message to myself and anybody like learn to find that for yourself because it will be your little own time travel to experience mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. practice for me slowing down mm -hmm. what you said sorry. go no Can no I, I, I yeah interrupt what me you said about your practice and just being still and that and then what you said about just you know just everything in time travel mm -hmm. and, and and what we're bringing through as artists and how, how and why we create kind of calls to the work that has come forth uh, with my daughter and her dreaming. And um, so there's a series that I'm working on right now, phot photographic and, and film series, that has a lot to do with recorded dreams of my daughter. I've been recording her since she was younger because I really felt like she was, you know, we all feel that, babies. But I was like, no, 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 I'm actively listening. Yeah. And it wasn't until years later, some of these recordings are eight, she's 12 now, um, eight and 10 years old, and I would discover like messages in these dreams she would have, and so a lot of the 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 relationship with water, I learned about the way that we embody culture differently in different spaces in Brazil when the the religion wasn't a performance, it was a part of everyday life, yeah. and the preservation of culture that happened through the subtleties of music and dance that infiltrated every part of culture, not just the ceremony. Mm -hmm. That's what really took me, and that's what made me go, oh. Mm -hmm. So, even though I was studying under a priestess of Oshun, who's the goddess of the river, and you know, there's a relationship with Imaya, the goddess of the sea, how I translate my work now is not in the ways that I've seen. Like, I've, there's nothing, I have nothing against um, the attempts to reclaim something that we weren't taught, but it's like less of a regurgitation of a language mm -hmm. and more of like, what is the, the new way that I'm relating to this thing? Mm -hmm. What is the evolution of that? Like, mm -hmm. I feel like my daughter had shown me an evolutionary way to really revere Mami Wata Yemaya mm -hmm. and the armor made lineage and whatever that is, you know, as well as, you know, other aspects of, 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 things that I've experienced with her, like her having a temper tantrum at two years old and me realizing that she needs to hug this tree every time she leaves the park. Mm -hmm. Little things like that. Mm -hmm. Not noticing the way that we receive information as adults, you know? So that experience of mothering really helped me listen more and, oh, yeah. and think about time more because it took me, you know, eight years to realize what she was saying as I and making this film and pairing it with images that are now and going, oh my gosh, this is part of the key of the way forward for for me mm -hmm. um, as a mother, as a woman. You know this umbrella of divine feminine that is reawakening and helping so many people understand. You know why they're here, where they are. It's, you know, um, a lot of that has to do with. Um, so my relation to time travel is relating to being a mother and, and what I feel like these new, maybe why I was called to doula work as well, like mm -hmm. just why the babies call forth <laughs> for mm -hmm. us to translate things differently. Yeah. I love that you all do the doula work. <laughs> do the yeah. do. Do the doula work. <laughs> yeah, I'm a mom also who was fortunate enough to have a doula. So. Mm -hmm. It's a special I have special relationship. Fortunate to be <laughs> called to it, to not have like gone to study, but be called to it over and over again. Um, it was a wonderful thing because I did feel for a long time like my dance and my performance and my, you know, performer personality, entertainment <laughs> industry was different from myself as a doula, as mm -hmm. someone who worked with herbs, as the, even to call myself a healer or whatever. That was something that was very separate. Um, and then while I was in Italy, actually, one of the women that I was working with 
help me form something, I started calling Belly Ballet because she was like, well, you're here with the baby. Just show me something, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then more of that, you know, came through that the more that we move on and with the earth, mm-hmm. with this relationship with earth, like even just telling my clients different things like, oh, no, take the baby outside once a day or little mm-hmm. things like that. Mm-hmm. So everything started to inform the other. So I think now I'm, I'm more um, confident in sharing things that I think I always thought were just innately me because it is not like we're getting pushed to do the work or pushed to dance work or pushed to performance work or brought to be mothers for a reason, right? It's all part of the artistic path, I believe. Definitely. I like what you said also um, as a question like, how do we as adults listen? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the childlike spirit is more in it, you know? And how do we as adults listen? And I just, my stomach. Um, I, just, I just taught this retreat. You were there. <laughs> um, a meditation retreat and one of the things that I as I was teaching I was really sewing it together which is like a very important unifying experience with, for me with my spirituality art Miriamness is that we are on a path mm-hmm. and that path has a a sound and that sound is a calling and that calling is asking us to question the normality of things that 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 calling is saying that things either don't need to be like this you don't need to be in this relationship like this you don't need to be in a house that is too small for you you don't need to be bro- whatever yeah. all the nagging stuff that's mm-hmm. like there's something's wrong that calling is asking us to look for the extraordinary and so returning to like how do we as adults listen I can't imagine a different entrance way into creating a body of work Mm -hmm. than all right what do I need to do right now Mm -hmm. like how do I begin well what is she saying or they are saying what is that calling um and I, but at the same time, you know, to be more vulnerable, that's kind of the idealistic space, and it kind of really does drive me. But there's also this other reality of assuming very little from the world. Mm. Mm. You know, like, I'm just going to do my thing, who knows if it's going to reap fruit or not. Yeah. And I know that their younger generation, they're very concerned about the reaping of the fruit because. <laughs> It's expensive now. It's yeah. not. It's getting harder and harder and harder to navigate through this world when you are navigating through an inner world. Like mm-hmm. you have a direct. You're trying to keep connecting to this, yeah. and the world. Either it feels it hard. It's yeah. hard. It's very hard. It's hard, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And 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 um, I don't have an answer to that for myself. I know that it's you know, just a matter of making it so they're in it, my my faith in what I'm doing, right? But the, so, I don't know if these connected, but the really itchy, itchy is that for me, I wasn't assuming much. I had, I felt from my growing up, I didn't belong here. I mean, the white community, Jewish community loved me. My black community was much harder on me. That's my experience. It was like, where all of this struggle, I was like, let me just be as small as possible, really. And I don't recommend that. But that was kind of my way of survival was like, I am a wall. I am a bucket. I, like, that is like, mm. survive by being small. And there was a seismic shift and I felt like the pain and sadness of cruelty got a fucking internal, sorry, <laughs> internal, <laughs> internal yes. microphone to my sadness. And it was like the whole world was yelling. And I'm talking about the, reckon, the reckoning 
of our history that all of a sudden it was like a lid open from the sewer and all of it came out. And I was not ex ex expecting that amplitude. Mm -hmm. It made me feel all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole nother maybe nice. conversation talk. <laughs> but my ask, and I really wanted to hear from all of you, was why do you think now there is even an iota of attention to black art, music, I mean, music maybe, yeah, the dance and sing, um, but, you know, visual art is, you know, for the aristocrat, you know, is this sort of intellectualized world, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to name it. I'll let y'all name it. But um, <laughs> no, but that's how I feel. I feel like there was all of a sudden. Um, You're talking about like after the great, great uprising. Yeah, I'm talking this, about this 2020. 20, yeah. We're talking about 2020. And I'm all talking of a sudden, about like if you have any black friends, support them. I'm talking yes. about like like all the black visual artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting supported and funded. And, and this yeah. insert. What I'm yeah. saying, the insurgence of attention. Not to say that it's real, sustaining, or all that much, and it's, you know, one would say we deserve a trillion. It's not about thank you so much. No. <laughs> I'm asking, what do you think? Why? Mm. Wow. I think that's a big question. I know. Um, <laughs> we, can just, we can just talk about it as much as we're no, able. I, no, I appreciate it. I think, I think the most clear perspective I have is, uh, we've always deserved attention and support and I think much of our making is highly functional beyond just being for a museum space. Maybe folks are starting to see, maybe it's performative. I think it's largely performative, some of the giving, um, not even giving, but <laughs> whatever they, whatever, however the people are choosing to support. Um, I don't think there can be too much of it though. I think it's complicated, obviously complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the clearest perspective I have right now, but also... Do you feel the change, though, in your own experience? Like, not really. Okay, okay. Not okay, really, cool. but also that's, that's, a, that's another conversation about, like, paths. Mm -hmm. Like, when you went to school, where you went to school, who you went to school with. Like, that's a... Which is a super white thing to talk about, but it's like, that's... For an artist, to me, like, you there, it's there. so freaking formulaic that it just hurts. It's so interesting to say that. Um, you're talking about, like, dance, like, who, the not politics. Not just dance, I mean, just the just art. Art. The art world. Yeah, politics. I mean, and I do think, I mean, we could just touch on, like, MFA. Mm. Like, mm -hmm. do you have one? Do you Got not it. have one? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. What's What did you do after that or between that? Did you go to a residency? Which one? You know, like, <laughs> like I just, you know, the, just all the gatekeeping that comes with all that mm -hmm. shit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, no, I don't feel highly affected by it as an artist. I had a very different scholastic path. I took my time. I became a mother very early in my life and prioritized those things. And so I just, I just finished school in 2020. So I don't, it's a different, it's a different way uh, of, of, some of the other artists that I've witnessed in their path, very different. Mm. I like yeah. that you brought up the school thing because mm -hmm. I finished graduate school in 2018 mm -hmm. and then the pandemic happened in 2020 and it wasn't until graduate school. You know, I was that type of dancer where they asked, who do you work with? That was the validation. Mm -hmm. Are you, who are you working with? Mm -hmm. That was the validation for us, and then it wasn't until then that I was like, residencies, grants, so this is how the non-mandinates do it. Like, I didn't realize that in order to be, because I had done it in Italy, just freelance yeah. on, you know, commercial work and mm -hmm. not very, no politics of academics and universities there mm -hmm. in that way at all. It's just mafia. But <laughs> it's <laughs> one other thing. <laughs> it's just if it's your cousin. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, but definitely going to graduate school made me realize like I've always been reticent sort of towards dance academia because I mm -hmm. felt like the dance academics were not 
movers. Mm -hmm. We're not mm -hmm. people who worked in the field and struggled to get that show up and bartended for weeks to be able to fund that performance project or whatever it was that I felt I and other mm -hmm. people were doing. Um, and I do think that that is a very important note because a lot of individual artists outside of the visual arts world don't know how many, how, never knew until recently in the pandemic, how much funds there are out there to support individual work. And the funds weren't allocated towards specific demographics like they are now. Mm. Yeah, which is weird too. Which is weird. And I will say that... Um, but important. It's weird and important, you know, mm -hmm. and... But there was a quote, so I recently went to the loophole retreat in, in Venice where Simone Le, who was the first black woman to represent the U.S. in the Biennale, brought like 700 black, 60 black women scholars and artists to talk and then seven black women to, to attend. And I think that for me was like a big example of like this attention to black art all mm -hmm. of a sudden because it wasn't just her, it was also... Uh, France had a black woman representing them and the UK, I think, mm -hmm. you know, and so there is a shift. And I found an article that she um, was interviewed in 2019 for like CBS. It was like a YouTube thing. And this white journalist is like, oh, you just sold a vase for like $18,000. Do you think this is like, you know, black arts getting this attention? Do you think this is like a trend? And I loved her answer because she's like, no, no, this is. Exactly. She's always so cool, though. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, this is, it's not a trend, you know? And it's, it, it maybe it has something to do with reparations, because there's always white guilt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it is exactly what needs to be happening right now, not just because, yes, black artists have always needed to be more seen mm -hmm. and not brushed under the rug, but because of what black artists are bringing to the table it's right now needs yeah. to be, it is the medicine a lot of it is the medicine that everyone needs to hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking about. I want to hear what you have to say, Rochelle. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think it's exactly that, that there's a way that black artists have our fingers on a pulse of, like, honestly being present with suffering and grief and mm -hmm. transmuting it, mm -hmm. that the entire world can benefit from witnessing and learning from. And they have always known that. There's a reason that like all American culture is actually derived from black, culture. black people, you know? <laughs> because we've been in this, we, we've been doing this, you know? And I think that's really important that I see culture as our medicine. And, you know, we as black people, we know that our culture is our medicine because we've been through so much. That is what we've had to move through it. And the artists, is the one who's holding that that lineage of culture and like continuing to shift it and work with it so to me it's like an inevitable process that also must happen for the earth and humanity to reckon with the current moment we're in of like climate crisis and grief and like late stage capitalism all of it it's we need like what else is there to do honestly i don't know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like that's yeah I want to just do, um, I'd love to have us do this conversation again in six months. I'm putting the seed out there um, because I, I see this as a chance for us to support each other in the places that we're seeing blind a little bit mm -hmm. because there is a reality of, you know, you know, like, the, I'm very visual, so the image is there's a people, you're trying to get into the speakeasy and you have your black card and you're like, MFA, Yale, da da da, this, you know, and they're like, okay, come on in, okay, where did you go? We don't know, you could be a little dangerous for the cause, we're yeah. beyond all, like there's all kinds of politics and layers and layers there and layers are. and layers and layers, yeah. but I feel like, I think, the empowerment of it all, of saying, you are sitting on, a, your birthright is, is valuable. Yeah. And like, how do we create a perfect instrument for Jamila, for Jossie, for Rochelle, for each person that's listening, so that we can hear you nicely? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I feel like that 
that instrument and that birthright to be heard is saying that you are a contribute contribution feeling that we're a contribution and and I think and I say that only because of what happens when I tell you we need you she's going down we're at the forefront we need your special <laughs> wiggy wiggy boo boo and you'll be like I got it I'm gonna do this weird plant dance and then I'm gonna throw it yeah. over here and like, this is perfect and this rest. is gonna and, and we're gonna lie down and rest it out and I'll be like this is exactly the medicine needed but to really allow a, a new I think for me this idea of being hidden obviously not recommended but and the growing into a sense of purpose, ownership that I'm sitting on a, something important. And I think that's why, for me, it's there's some weird stuff in the politics of this, what I call this um, kind of fabricated, strange insurgence of attention. But the most thing is it's helped me to identify that I have what people need. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and that's what I was just gonna say. And then also taking the final statements because we're gonna oh sorry it. just taking, to say taking the, this moment in time out of it and talking about time travel. Like I'm constantly breaking away from my ego because it's like, okay, Miriam, I guess it's about you. Okay, Jassius, but it's not because it's your grandmothers mm -hmm. coming through your great great grandmas or great 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 grandmas. Sometimes I don't know what's pushing me towards that thing, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I think. The listening is yeah. is what's so important in that, and letting go of like the like there is the I am always right. Mm -hmm. We always have that I am, but it's that that awareness of it and letting go of this ego that's fabricated within this patriarchal society construction we've been in for eight thousand years, you know, so that we can step out of that and know that the more that we attach to the the, the higher I am, the more that we connect. Just like this conversation, just like what's happening here and why I love being in circle with with women who are, and not not, not only women, you know, men who are aware of their wounds, you know, who, people who are aware of this energy of the creator, the divine feminine, and her really calling to us, because it's not, it's not us. It's not just about you and and them wanting to buy into blackness. It's about the information. Yeah. Yeah. Rochelle, any closing shares? I mean, I'll just like echo the divine feminine because like <laughs> yeah. to me that's like what it, it always comes back to, and that's like so much of what. I do my best to humble myself to and be in reverence to and um, you know especially I, I think a lot about climate and I think especially in this moment like what does it mean to humble ourselves to the earth humble ourselves to nature in that feminine way yeah. nice. I'm just enjoying that so much of what I'm listening to with you all is keeps reminding me of like Buddhist mentality of poisoning into medicine Mm -hmm. and alchemy and um, yeah. it's like the ability to, to transmute things yeah yeah so I'm thankful for that all right thank you so very much for joining me thank you Jossie thank, thank you Rochelle thank you Jamila. thank you love love love